Hey everybody. So yes, uh, I was already introduced as a Postgres consultant. So, uh, yeah, my main expertise area is uh, high availability for databases and especially Postgres. So yeah, we do a lot of consultancy for a lot of local customers over here. And uh, we build a system for them for high availability using Postgres application. So yeah, my talk also today uh, goes through uh, the new feature that came in Postgres 9.0. So just to get an idea how many of you guys are using Postgres in production. Very good, very good. And how many of you tried Postgres 9.0? Great. <laughs> so you did. So uh, there, there were very nice new features that came with Postgres 9.0, and one of them was streaming replication. And that was one of the most wanted uh, features for quite some time, especially when people compare Postgres to MySQL. They always say that, oh, MySQL has got replication out of box, and there's nothing like that in Postgres. And that was a very valid complaint, because there were application solutions available for Postgres, but they are very, very hard to implement, it's like Sloney, Bucato. Has anybody tried using Sloney over here? And did you find it hard to uh, maintain and to monitor the Sloney uh, processes? Because it, it gets a bit it gets a bit annoying, because it's all trigger-based. So uh, it was always needed in the Postgres world to have a solution that's based not on triggers, but on the transition log files. So in Postgres 9.0, they came up with the proper solution. So we'll be covering those areas today. Uh, agenda, we'll be covering uh, a little bit of history on Postgres application solutions, and a little bit about, about the streaming application internals, and what the limitations we got uh, with the current application setup, and how do you quickly set up a house standby, which is pretty easy with the latest version, and uh, how do you monitor lags uh, with the streaming application, and a little bit about conflict resolution, because with every application solution you get conflicts, so how do you resolve those conflicts with uh, the streaming application in 9.0, and a little bit about the future of streaming application for Postgres. Starting with the history, uh, we all know that uh, Postgres doesn't have anything out of box for replication. So there used to be a lot of solutions, and they're still out there, uh, like Sloney, Bacato, Londisk by Skype. And uh, they've been there for quite some time. They're very stable, and a lot of people are using them, and they're very happy with it. So with this new replication uh, architecture, like using streaming uh, replication, those solutions are not going to die because they have got their own, uh, like they, they basically cover their own areas. Like with Sloney, you can uh, replicate a set of tables. You don't have to replicate the full database. You don't have to replicate the full cluster. Uh, so they have their own uh, advantages and their own disadvantages. But now at least Postgres has something that is out of box and that, that's very easy to set up. And uh, none of them are using transaction log files. They're all trigger-based. So you have that added complexity to your database that every table has to have a trigger on it. And another thing that used to be a problem with Sloney was that you need to have a primary key on each and every table. That, big, that becomes a bit of a problem when you've got a big table. Then you have to maintain a big index as well on that table. So some of the databases, you can't really have a primary key on all tables. So yeah, there used to be a problem for Sloney and other or application solutions. Um, prior to version 9.0, Postgres used to support something that was using uh, val logs. Val, val log is a, a transaction log file in Postgres. So I'll be using that term a lot of times in the presentation, but a val is like a right ahead log file, and that's like a transaction log file for a Postgres database. So before 9.0, uh, there used to be something uh, that's called warm standby server setup in Postgres, but that was that was file-based shipping. There wasn't rec record-based shipping, so there used to be a little bit of a lag between the primary server and the standby server. And another thing, uh, with those warm standby server setups, you couldn't query the standby server. You can just have it as a failover setup, like whenever you want to do a failover, you can just take your standby server out of recovery mode and make it a, prom uh, make it a primary server. Uh, but you couldn't do a record-based log shipping because it would only ship a log file once it reaches that size, that 16 megabyte. But with 9.0, you can do record-based log shipping. So uh, warm standby server in Postgres before 9.0 used to be very complex. Uh, 
the use, uh, there is still, it's still possible in uh, 9.0 as well. So if you have a system that's using the old uh, method of using warm standby server, it will still work in Postgres. If you're using PG underscore standby to do that, it will still work. But uh, you just have to be careful with a few settings. So I will cover those settings later on in the presentation. But yeah, everything that is that was working with prior versions will still work with 9.0 as well. Streaming replication, what it is, uh, it's similar to how you had before for warm standby server, but it's just that now you can query the, that standby server. You can run your uh, read-only queries on the standby server, and it's record-based. So it's not file-based, so you won't have those big lags between the primary server and the standby server. And then it's asynchronous. It's still not synchronous. The, the, the original patch that came out for uh, streaming replication had synchronous replication in it, but because of the complexity and there were so many areas that were not properly covered, they didn't release uh, synchronous replication. But it is coming in 9.1 that's going to be released around the end of this year. And then it supports, supports multiple concurrent slaves. So you can have uh, one primary server and multiple slaves with that uh, setup. But you can't do cascading replication, uh, which you can do in Sloney. So by cascading, I mean that uh, a slave cannot send data to another slave, but only a master can send data to all the slaves. Again, it's very simple to set up. It's not like uh, the way you used to set up warm standby server using PG standby. That was very complex. But now, because everything is out of box, so you don't have to uh, worry about setting up external tools to uh, cater for everything for replication. Uh, some, something about the internals. Uh, with uh, streaming replication, uh, there were two new processes that were introduced in Postgres 9.0. One is the val sender, and the other one is the val receiver. So you can see those processes as, as you do a PS uh, and look for the Postgres process, you will see those two new processes when you have the streaming replication set up. So what these processes do, uh, the first one is the val receiver. What a val receiver does is that it uses libpq, and uh, it tries to, it, it sends a call to the master server, and it tells the master that I need to start streaming replication. And once uh, the master gets a request for streaming replication, it, it starts uh, the, val uh, the val sender process. And the val sender process is then meant to s send all those replication logs from the transition log files to uh, the slave servers. So uh, what host standby does is that, uh, as I mentioned before, that prior to version 9.0, we used to have warm standby servers that were able to do the replication through uh, val log files, but you were never able to query those servers. They were always in recovery mode. So if you had to fare over, you put up a trigger file, and that would basically promote it as a primary server, and then you can just use that primary server. But with the latest, latest version of Postgres, you can set up your standby server in a way that you can query those servers as well. So they work in a host standby mode. Like they always have the latest data, but again, there will be a little bit of a lag because it's asynchronous. So it will, uh, they will you can't basically say that it's 100% exactly a copy of the master. It's more like eventual consistency. So eventually it will be consistent, but it won't be consistent all the time. And host standby lets you fail over uh, to uh, the slave server without dropping the connection. So if you have a connection to the standby server and that is open, so if you do a failover and you promote it as a primary server, that connection won't drop. It will just change the transaction mode. Because in a host standby server, on a, sta on, on, a, on a standby server, whenever you create a new connection, it always creates a connection with a read-only transaction mode. So what it does is that as soon as you do a failover, it will change the transaction mode so that you can do rewrites on that as well. So, uh, now we can look at quickly setting up host standby. It's, it's very simple with version 9.0. So there were a few new settings that were introduced uh, in version 9.0. Uh, there are val level, max val senders, and val keep segments. We'll go through the details of those settings now. Val level, uh, the three options that you got for this setting. Uh, one is minimal, archive, and host standby. Minimal is exactly similar to what we used to have before 9.0. So if you 
have a setup that's using PG standby to do your warm standby server, or if you got your own scripts that are managing the warm standby server, uh, and you want to use the same setup in version 9.0 as well, just keep it minimal. You don't, if you're not using the latest functionality, you can use your old systems with the same setup in version 9.0 as well. But if you want to set up a warm standby server, uh, then you just set it to archive. And if you want to set up a hot standby server to which you can send the queries, uh, send the read-only queries, you need to set it up as, as hot standby. Uh, well, there's a little bit of a performance hit uh, if you're using archive or hot standby because the VAD log will be storing a little bit of more information to cater for setting up one standby server or setting up host standby. But it's, 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 it's very minimal. So you can do a benchmark on that. There are a lot of people who are doing that right now, but because it's still in development phase, like there is a version that's available, but uh, that supports host standby, but still there's a lot of work that is going on on making it uh, much better. So there is, a, again, there's a little bit of a performance hit, but it's, it's very minimal. It's very, very minimal. So. The next setting is Maxwell senders. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a new process uh, that was introduced in version 9.0 for Postgres that basically uh, caters for host standby. So it takes requests from standby servers, and once it, re it receives a request from uh, the standby server, it starts sending those valid records to the standby servers. So this setting will basically enable that process. So you need to have a positive value for this uh, uh, for this setting, so it should be more than zero, uh, and it depends on how many slave servers you got. If you have, um, say, six slave servers, you just set it to six. So you need that many number of senders to send val log files to uh, the standby servers. It starts with a default of zero, but that wouldn't let you do any hot standby setup. You need to set it to uh, the number of standby servers you got in the hot standby setup. Okay, so next is val, max val segments. So that's again very important. Uh, if you're setting up host and buy, that means that every time a new val log file is generated, uh, it ships it across to uh, the standby server and uh, it wouldn't keep any copy of that val log file until you tell the server to do that. So uh, in most of the times, setting it to zero will will basically do the job as well, but at times you can end up in a situation where something went wrong with one of the standby server, like it went offline or something bad happened to that box, and once you bring it back online, you want to take it back to that state where the primary server is right now, so you need those red log files to do that partial bit of recovery. So setting it to, setting it to zero is not really a good option, just set it to uh, a value that is uh, that is according to your disk space because each val log file would take 16 megabytes. So I generally go with setting it to around 100 val log files. But you can put it to any number you want. It depends on the amount of disk space you got. So yeah, yeah. It's just a few recommendations of that. So set it higher if you're using host standby, but make sure your disk space is available. And in case you're doing a warm standby server, you're not setting up it as a host standby server, you don't really need any uh, VAD log file for that case, because as soon as a new file gets available, it gets shipped to the standby server, and it's always replaying that VAD log file. But if you're setting up a host standby server, in that case, you really need those VAD log files in case of a crash on the standby. A quick start on host standby. So have anybody over here has done PITR in Postgres, point in time recovery? Nobody? Okay, so uh, post, uh, when, when you're setting up a host standby server, it's basically you need to take the exact same uh, data folder dump, like a file system dump of the, of the whole database to the standby server because the OIDs cannot change uh, because what, what, what streaming application does is that it takes the full val log file and just replace that onto the standby server. So the both of the environment should be exactly the same. So what we're doing is we're taking a full file system level dump off the whole Postgres installation and putting it onto the standby server. That's how you start the setup. So before you do that, you use a few Postgres functions to take that dump. Uh, the first one is pg start backup. What that does is that it uh, asks Postgres to do a checkpoint. A checkpoint in Postgres is where you basically write all the data and dirty buffers 
to the disk so that you don't have anything sitting in the memory right now. So you just want to make a consistent dump of the whole database. So you run that command and then you take a full file system dump. You can use rsync or you can use, you can tot up a full, uh, full database dump and move it to the standby server. And then once that is done, you do a PG stop backup. That way you have an exact same replica of the primary server on the standby server. And once that is done, we will go through the next steps. And uh, for that initial step, uh, there are a few tools that are still in development and that would basically make the job easy because right now you have to do it all manually. Like you, you run that query, take the dump, and then do a PG stop backup. But there's a new module that's called PG underscore base backup that's coming in version 9.1, which will help you do that automatically. So you just do PG base backup, give it the folders of the primary server and the secondary server. It automatically takes the full backup of the primary, ships it across to the standby server using rsync or the command that you give it. And uh, that will basically uh, make the job a lot easier because I've seen a lot of people making mistakes while doing these dumps. Like they would do PG start backup, but they would forget to do PG stop backup. Or they wouldn't have proper checks to uh, get the return codes of these functions. Like they would do PG start backup and they wouldn't check the uh, return value of that function call because at times it might just give you error that I can't do a check when something else is going wrong over there and they will still take a file dump. They wouldn't do it properly. So that new tool will take care of all of those problems. Uh, next thing is uh, once you've taken a dump and you've shipped it across to the standby server, uh, you need to set up a few things uh, on the Postgres or confine in the master server uh, and they are uh, setting up the val level as we uh, discussed before, uh, that you need to set it to host standby for host standby replication. And well, keep segment should be set to 100. That's just a starting point. It depends on your own scenario. If you are setting up your uh, server as a ROM standby server or a host standby server, it totally depends on that. You can go with a zero or a number that you are comfortable with. And then max well senders. I've set it to one because uh, I'm just setting up one slave server. If you're setting up multiple safe server, like you're setting up six safe servers, you set it to six. So you need one valve sender for each standby server. And then archive mode, it should be enabled, and then an archive command as well. That basically tells the Postgres server that take, uh, whenever you got the new archive file available, the val log file available, ship it to uh, my archive folder. And then uh, the next thing is uh, you need to do a few things on the standby server as well. The first thing is setting up the pg underscore hpa or conf entry. pg underscore hpa or conf file is uh, it basically has all the authentication rules for Postgres server. So you need to uh, you need to enable access to the replication database. That's an internal database. You can't really see that database on the primary server. It's invisible to the, to the normal user, but it's used for doing all the management work for the host and by server setup for, or, or for streaming application. So you need to enable access to that uh, to, to that database from the standby server, and it has to be trusted. Uh, usually people don't like putting trust in there, but uh, yeah, you need to, like, they, you can't really go with MD5 or it just doesn't work. So it's going to be improved in the next versions, but for now it's just trusted. The next thing is uh, setting, up, uh, setting up the host standby setting in, uh, in the Postgres or conf file of the standby server setup. So you set it to on if you want to set up your server as a standby server. And then setting up a recovery.conf file. Uh, it's exactly the same as you used to do with the WOM standby servers in the past prior to version 9.0. And uh, but the only change is uh, now a new setting has been introduced that's called standby underscore mode. So you set up a new recovery.conf file and set up a restore command that's similar to the archive command that you set up on the master server. So once that is set up, you set you start your server, and as soon as the server sees a recovery.conf file in the data folder, it automatically goes into a recovery mode. But the difference between a warm standby server and a host standby server is that when it sees a recovery file in there and it, it basically can see a value for standby mode enabled, it automatically tells the Postgres server that I can accept connections as well. Because in a warm standby server, it can't accept connections. It can only replay the log files and it's always in a recovery mode. But in a host standby server, the recovery mode means that it can even take connections and it can run read-only queries on top of it. Yep. Uh, so you're... 
So we'd have to do the same thing as far as like our syncing the files over or whatever. Because I mean, you have it set that it's a shared directory right now. Yeah. But we'd still have to go through those steps of our syncing the. Yeah, our syncing is for different uh, purpose. It's basically our syncing is used for taking the full file system down of the data directory. No, no, I meant your restore command and your and your. Oh, you can use our sync over here as well. It depends on right. So yeah. You, because your examples show that, you know, a shared folder, so I just yeah. wanted to, okay. Oh, yeah, you can use any command. You can use your own script as well over here okay. with proper exit codes. Like, you can check if the file is properly copied or not, if there's anything. Because I would prefer having a, your own script over here instead of using CP command. So just have your proper checks in there that if the file has been properly copied or not. Because I've seen problems where the file is not copied properly, and it can take the server into a state where it just doesn't want any, any more connections. So you need to have a proper script that will make sure that the file is copied across to the other side. So, yeah. Uh, some limitations with the standby server. So you can't run DDL statements on the standby server because uh, they use transaction IDs. And the standby server doesn't support any transaction IDs. It wouldn't generate, it wouldn't generate any transaction ID on the standby server. It's always taking everything from the primary server. Next thing, uh, you can't, ex oh sorry, it was DM DML. So a DML is like insert, update, or delete because they use transition IDs. And then the next thing is DDL because the DDL would change the system catalog. As soon as you do an alter table or you create a new index, it will create new entries in the system catalogs. And we can't do that on a standby server because it's checking everything from the primary server. And then queries like select for share, for update, they wouldn't have they wouldn't work as well because they do a few things with the underlying data files, and we can't touch those files on the standby server. We're taking everything from the, yeah. Do you have to do that on the master server? Oh, yeah, 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 you can do everything on the master server. It's just that you can't do it on the standby because you want to keep everything consistent. So if you do anything on the standby, it will go back to the master. So yeah. that's multi-master if we can support that in the next version. <laughs> OK, so some more limitations, two-phase commits. Uh, they won't be possible as well, because even if you're doing a select with a two-phase commit, it still uh, creates a var log entry. It still creates transaction log entry. So you can't do a two-phase commit even if it's for a select statement. So yeah, two-phase commits won't work on standby servers. You can do them on master, but you can't do them on the standby server. Sequence updates, they won't work as well. Uh, you can't use temporary tables on standby servers. So they're going to be supported in the next version, but right now you can't do any temporary tables. That's a bit of a problem because you, if you're using a standby server for reporting, you want to use temporary tables over there, but right now that's a kind of a limitation. Yeah. So does that mean you can't find the value of a... So does that mean you can't find the value of a sequence from the slave since CurveL won't work until you call yeah, it? Yeah, current, current value will work, but you can't increment the value of the sequence. In current uh, versions of Postgres, if you try and call uh, current val before next val is called, yeah. it fails. Yeah, it does it. Okay, the, the, if you call a current val before the next val, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. When the, yeah, because the session hasn't or the sequence hasn't been defined. Yeah, yet, like yeah. I, I haven't tried that with host and by the sequences, so. I can check that and I can let you know. But uh, it sh like, you can't do a next well or a set well with that because that basically is changing the sequence. So it won't be possible for the standby server. So if, it's, if it is giving an error with version 9.0, that's a problem, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't. You can try that with 9.0. Yeah, it shouldn't give you a problem with 9.0. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, no temporary tables. That's a, that's, a, that's a bit of a limitation because uh, you really want to use temporary tables with reporting. Uh, but you can't do that right now. And if you're using a hash index, that because a hash index right now doesn't generate a val log entry, so that wouldn't be replicated. If you're doing anything with a hash index on the primary server, it wouldn't go to the to the other side. But the normal index on Postgres is a B-tree index. They're not normally hash indexes, but if you are using hash indexes, there's a bit of a limitation. Um, in, a, like in every replication solution, there are always conflicts. So there are some conflicts that are possible with uh, the host standby setup. So like if you're dropping a table space on the primary server, it can cause a problem on the standby server because uh, there can be a few objects in that table space that are being used in queries on the standby server. So as soon as the standby server finds a drop, database, drop table space command, it will try to drop the table space, but because 
the, the tables that are in the table space are being used by the standby server, it would go into a wait, wait scenario, like we would just keep on waiting and waiting and waiting. So that can cause a lot of issues because your queries are just waiting and your whole uh, standby server start lagging because it can't replay that bad log entry. So that can be a problem scenario for uh, host and buy. But there are ways to resolve that. I'll cover that later on as well. And then if you're trying to drop a database on the primary server, that will make uh, the standby server drop all connections because it has to do that. If you are dropping a database, you can't really make any connections or database on the standby server. So it will just drop all the connections and drop the database. And if you want to see, uh, if you want to get a report on all those conflicts and how they were resolved, the, you, you have a view in Postgres that's called PGStat database conflicts. So it will list all the conflicts that have happened and how did it resolve it. If it canceled the query or what exactly it did to resolve that conflict. The two uh, very important settings in the Postgres log conf file on the master server that can help you resolve those conflicts. One of them is max standby streaming delay, and the other one is vacuum defer cleanup age. So the first one is max standby streaming delay. So what it does is that it puts up a timeout on the queue, like say you were dropping a table space on the primary server, and one of the objects in that table space was being used on the standby server. So that means that it will try to drop it, and it will go into a wait scenario and you keep on waiting forever until that query has ended for the select. But if you set up a value, say, of 30 seconds on max standby streaming delay, that means that after 30 seconds, it will automatically cancel that query and it will execute uh, that value lock record. So that way, you cannot have a more than 30 second delay on your standby server. The next one is vacuum defer cleanup age. Uh, the, most of the problems with host standby server are with vacuum because uh, on a primary server, in order to uh, do the maintenance, there's an auto vacuum process which keeps on vacuuming tables every now and then. And it basically looks at the number of inserts, updates, or deletes that are happening on the table. So what happens is that, say you have a table which is just getting hit all the time. It's getting inserts, updates, deletes all the time. And on the standby server, you're trying to get records out of the table. So as soon as it goes, the primary server starts a vacuum, it basically starts uh, changing the tuples on that primary server for that table. And those tuple have different rows, different record on the standby server. So both of them start having conflicts because the standby server is showing the old records, but after a vacuum on a primary server, it's showing the new records. So in order to, in order to take care of that kind of a scenario and to get rid of that conflict, they introduce a new setting called defer cleanup age. So what that does is that it will defer a vacuum process by a specific number of transaction IDs. So if you say, if you set up this value to 1,000, it won't vacuum on the primary server until you've done 1,000 transactions on the table when the vacuum was actually going to happen. So it will put up a delay on the vacuuming and it can introduce a little bit of a bloat on the tables as well, but it will help you resolve those conflicts where you're trying to run a vacuum on a table that's already in uh, in, in, a in a transaction or in a, in, a, in a select query on the standby server. So yeah, that's already helps with the vacuuming issues because vacuum is causing a lot of problems for host and server right now. It's just a fix for now. They're going to improve it in the future because even this setting is causing a lot of problems because as soon as you put a defer cleanup page, that creates a lot of bloat in the tables. So if a table was supposed to be vacuum right now, it won't be. It will wait for another, say, 1,000 transactions to get to a point where it can be vacuumed. But that will solve a scenario on the standby server side that it can be used for doing read-only queries. A little bit about administration of host standby. So uh, there are a few parameters that you can't really change on the standby server. So if you want to change those parameters, you need to change them on the primary server as well. Uh, and, through your, and they are max connections max prepared transactions and max log per transaction. So if you are going to change them on the standby server, make sure that you change them on the primary server before you do it on the standby server. And they always have to be greater than or equal to the value on the primary server. So you can't have them less than uh, the primary <coughs> server. Uh, anything that, uh, that uses DB link, 
in Postgres, that won't be affected because uh, as I mentioned before that everything on the standby server is read only, but if you're making, if you're using DB link to connect to a remote database and do an insert or an update, that will still work the same way. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect that. So a transaction is read only, only for that database. Anything that is outside of that database server is not relevant to the host standby server. So they are still, you can still do writes, but onto remote databases. And you cannot create additional indexes uh, that are only on the standby server. You, if you want to create an index, create it on the primary, and that will get replicated to the secondary server. You can't have just indexes on the standby server, because that's not possible. And uh, as I mentioned before, if you do a drop database or alter database, if you change anything on the database, anything that's connected to that database will, uh, connected to the database on the standby server will automatically quit, and you have to reconnect, reconnect all those clients, uh, because primary server won't allow you to do that on the standby server and because it has to copy the same val segment on the standby server and it can't do that if something is connected to the database. And the statistic collector on the standby server will work the same way as it worked on the primary server. It will still keep on collecting all the stats uh, in the, and it, you can even run an analyze on that database and it will work the same way as it used to work before. A little bit on monitoring. Uh, in order to check the lags uh, between the primary and the secondary server, there are a few uh, functions that are available. You can run the, you can run the f uh, PG last X log receive location function on the standby server. It gives you the val log location, and then you can run PG current X log location on the master server and get the two values, compare them, that how uh, far are they from each other. So that will give you a lag between the two, uh, two servers. A little bit about tuning host standby. So, with, as as I mentioned before, there are a few settings uh, that you can use to resolve conflicts uh, for host standby. But you have to be really careful when setting these values. Say, if you set up your vacuum defer age to very high, that can create a lot of bloat in the database. So, if you are playing around with those settings, keep on monitoring the database server to see any bloats in the database. Because uh, if you get a bloated database, that wouldn't really help on the standby server side. And then uh, the max standby delay as well. Uh, when you're playing around with that setting, again, you have to be very careful because if you set up a high delay, that can create a lot of lags. And if you're using it as a failover, uh, fail using your, host, your standby server as a failover node, then that can make it a little bit of a problem because if you have a big lag from the primary server, that is not really a useful standby server anymore. Uh, there's some uh, people have already started working on uh, writing some very useful tools for host standby, and uh, one of them is being written by uh, Second Quadrant. Second Quadrant is again uh, they do PostgreSQL consulting and PostgreSQL support, and they've written a very nice tool that's called Rep Manager, and that does the whole thing that we just discussed automatically. And uh, it's it has got two components. One is a uh, one is a uh, command line tool to run all those commands for setting up host standby, and the other one is a, is, a, is a management console within the tool, which basically monitors all the lags and, uh, and does all the administration work for host standby setup. So it'd be a good idea if you guys can go through the tool and go through the documentation in order to get rid of all those manual commands, and it will just do the whole job automatically. You don't have to do anything of that. So future roadmap, what, uh, They've got planned for the next features in streaming replication. The next thing that is uh, that is going to come out very soon is PG base backup. It's I saw a few days back that it was already committed in the 9.1 branch, so it's already done and it's already available as a dev release. So if you guys have access to the to the CVS of Postgres, you can just get the latest code and try it out. It works with version 9.0 as well. I've tried it and it works sweet. And uh, that's going to be released as a stable uh, product in version 9.1. And the next one is improve, they're going to improve monitoring because right now when you execute those functions to get the lags, they give you a number that's not easy to understand. So if you're writing scripts around those values, it's really hard to do that right now. So they're coming up with proper views in, uh, in the Postgres database that would tell you how much is the lag between the primary and the secondary server. And the next thing that's very important is a synchronous application. That's, the code is already there, 
but it's just going through a testing phase right now to get committed in the version 9.1, and that is going to be released around the end of this year. So, yep, yeah. that's about it. So, if you guys got any questions, happy to take them. Yep. Yeah. Um, two questions: Any plans for clustering at all? And also, any plans to integrate something like PG Pool so that your read queries would automatically go to one of the yeah. slaves or whatever? Yeah, clustering. Uh, what do you mean by clustering? Like it's it is doing the whole thing right now. So well, what, what exactly you need? Uh, just you know to uh, uh, distribute the loads on writes and things like that. Yeah, just, I, mean, I guess multi-masters. That's a very, that, kind of, that's a very debatable topic. And right now, there's only one tool that can do the job. That's that's PG Pool. And PG Pool again is does give you a lot of trouble as well. It's not, it's not an easy to use tool. It is easy to set up, but it gives you a lot of trouble. You need to do a lot of monitoring on that tool to make it useful. So, but I haven't seen anything in plans yet to do anything like that in Postgres. Like you have to, like what I usually do is I do the load balancing on the application level, like uh, create my write, do, have a write object and I have a read object. And for the read objects, I can use any of my uh, slaves. And for the right object, I only use the master server. So do that on the application level, because PG Pool gives you a lot of trouble. Like I'm not a fan of PG Pool myself. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you could use something like LVS as, as a front end to your slaves, so you could send all read queries yeah. to that uh, virtual IP. LVS, um, I haven't used that. Then it's virtual server, you know, like to. Can it understand the database balancer? Command? Sorry. Can it understand what an insert is and what a what a select? No, it's is? real simple. It just uh, it's just a TCP layer based? two just rebadges the uh, Ethernet header with well for direct routing rebadges yeah. the Ethernet header with the MAC address of the uh, real server, which mm -hmm. is behind the uh, um, which is behind the load balancer. I was gonna my question was gonna be is that gonna work with um, Postgres in the way that we use that we use that a similar that kind of system with MySQL at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, yeah, because uh, as as you mentioned before, PG Pool is more of a connection pool, which is which can understand the database uh, commands. But if you're using a load balancer like you mentioned, if it can't understand what an insert is and what a select is, it doesn't know where to send the insert. Because uh, insert... no, I'm talking about read only. Oh, read only. Just... Oh, yeah, you can do that. Then, then yeah. that's not a problem. That's right. that's not a problem at all. If you're okay. just doing read only, it's good. Oh, we'll, uh, that just I think works. We'll be moving to using Postgres. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> You mentioned this uh, replication manager thing yeah. where basically you've got this whole uh, sort of resource manager written around it. Why not use Pacemaker? Why not plug into something that is already there that you can just use? Why reinvent the wheel? Which one are you mentioning? Pacemaker, the, the Linux cluster stack resource manager, which happily mm -hmm. manages replication from MySQL, by the way. And it already has Postgres okay. integration. Okay. So why so not? So how does it manage the replication? Does it use the No, it, it currently place? doesn't. It's something it doesn't. That, that I'd love to to add or seen added, mm -hmm. uh, and I was kind of wondering what the motivation was for basically instead. Well, oh, the only motivation was basically rolling. people complaining that MySQL has everything out of box and Postgres doesn't have proper replication and whatever. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about uh, oh, the implementing two. the replication in the database server, which is perfectly fine. Yeah, you're talking about two. But yeah, but, oh, but okay. having the having the cluster resource management in a separate tool rather than ah, okay. plugging into an existing infrastructure. Yeah, that's just, just a tool that somebody did. It's not a, it's not an official Postgres tool. It's just a tool that somebody, because uh, it was done by the original writer of streaming application. So he did it, he did that tool just as an add-on. So it's not a Postgres tool specific tool. Anybody can write that. Like even myself, I'm writing a tool right now which is going to give you a front end a, a basically a GUI framework from which you can easily see your clusters and you can run all those commands. So like everybody is writing tools right now to have a, like make it easy to use. So that's about it. Like you can write your own tool as well. So yeah. Uh, good day. Yep. Is there anything you need to do to your database when you set it up or can you have it running as a normal standalone thing and then at a later stage enable this? 
you, have, you don't have to do anything on the database. It's not like Sloney or other replication solutions because you don't have to run those scripts to create all those triggers, and uh, you don't have to do anything. It's just, it's just very, very simple to set up. It takes five minutes to set up the standby cluster. It's very, very simple. That was the main motivation behind having a native replication solution because everybody, when, whenever somebody looked at Sloney, they're like, oh, okay, we don't want to touch it. So uh, it's, it's very complex. We don't want to have primary keys on every table. So, and Sloney doesn't do DDL. So whenever you want to do a DDL, it's, it's terrible. It's just terrible. It will lock the whole thing, and then it will do a DDL. But in this case, it's just plain simple. You don't have to do that. We better make this the last question. You talk about getting uh, the data to a standby, but what do you do when the master fails and you want to use the standby? Yeah, you basically, yeah, exactly. A very good question. So uh, when you set up your recovery.conf file, I basically didn't have that in here, but uh, you give it a trigger file. When you set up your trigger, when you set up your standby server in the recovery file, you have a trigger underscore file setting, and you give it a file name over there. So, as your standby server is in recovery mode all the time, as soon as it's it gets that file in that folder, it will go back into the primary mode, and it will become a primary server. So, but if you want to bring your failed master back into the cluster, you have to do it all over again. So that's a bit of an annoying process. So, and that's the same thing with Sloney as well. If you do a failover in Sloney, you have to rebuild the whole thing all over again. So yeah, that's a bit of an annoying thing. But I saw a few uh, mails in the, uh, on, on, the, on the hackers list in Postgres where they are thinking about doing something for that specific case as well, where the master can again catch up with the standby, and then you can promote it back as a master. But this, the, the tool that I mentioned rep MGR that can do that can make your life easy like it can do those things automatically for you like once you bring that node back in it can take those backups and it can help you do those manual jobs automatically yeah thank, let's thank Shab for presenting for us thank you guys oh thank you so much <laughs>